All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm John Shank. I'm a member of BMS's, BMSS Advisors and CPAs. Uh, we appreciate you taking time to join us for this morning's webinar, BMSS Presents an Update for the Nonprofit Industry. BMSS was established in 1991 and has grown to become one of the top 100 accounting and advisory firms in the U.S. with the recent addition of our team members in Ridgeland, Mississippi. Now, with over 320 employees across our family of companies, we assist clients in a variety of industries and services providing accounting, advisory, IT, payroll, PEO, and well solutions in an effort to bring our clients peace of mind and provide the exceptional client experience. Additionally, we're an independent member of the BDO Alliance USA, a nationwide association of independently owned local and regional accounting firms, consulting and service firms with similar client service goals. Uh, for more information about our firm, you can visit uh, bmss.com. Uh, before we get started, there are a couple of housekeeping items to mention. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll try to get to those at the end of the presentation. There will be polling questions. If you'd like to receive CPE credit, please answer those as they pop up. Since our founding in 1991, we've consistently provided services in the not-for-profit industry. Uh, if you're on this webinar today, you probably work in or provide services uh, to nonprofits, and you understand how it's an ever-changing, always fluid environment. Our goal this morning is to give you a few updates that we think pertinent, and if you have an issue that we don't cover, uh, please feel free to reach out to us after the webinar. Today, we're very fortunate to have Whitney Roberson, uh, Rebecca Tipton, and Jonathan Purs with us uh, to provide those updates on what is happening in the nonprofit industry. Let me provide a little background on our panelists. Uh, first up, we'll have Whitney Roberson. Uh, she joined BMSS in 2019 and is the manager in our Huntsville office. Her primary focus is the nonprofit industry and she serves those clients in assurance, tax, and consulting. Whitney is a certified nonprofit accounting professional and is on the BDO Alliance's Nonprofit Niche Leaders Collaborative Roundtable. After Whitney, we'll have Rebecca Tipton, who joined BMSS in 2022 and currently serves as a manager of BMSS's Outsourced Human Resource Services. With prior experience as a human resource manager and as a human resource consultant, uh, Rebecca specializes in HR advisory where she assists in both compliance and people strategy across many industries. Known for her accuracy and desire to learn, Rebecca is a pro at providing consultation and support on all stages of the employee life. And after Rebecca, we'll hear from Jonathan Purs, who's a senior security analyst for Abacus Technologies. In, in this role, he oversees the security team, engineers security solutions for clients, analyzes and remediates security threats, and also spearheads security product development and implementation. With a master's degree in cybersecurity from the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and as a successful small business owner, he now uses those skills and experience to help develop and enhance Abacus Technologies' rapidly growing security practice. And with that, welcome everyone, and I'll now turn it over to Whit. Thank you, John, for the introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. Today, I'll be covering nonprofit updates from a tax perspective, which I understand is a super thrilling topic. Um, there aren't many uh, major changes to the Form 990 or 990PF, so I'll be covering a few acts currently in the pipeline and then tax credits that may be available for your organization, as well as a few other relevant topics. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to start with the Streamlining Federal Grants Act. The Streamlining Federal Grants Act was introduced in July 2023 and is a bipartisan legislation designed to improve the effectiveness and performance of federal grants and cooperative agreements. 
simplify the application and reporting requirements, and facilitate greater coordination among agencies responsible for delivering services to the public. It also seeks to improve the services delivered to communities and organizations that historically have not received federal grants or cooperative agreements. The act would also establish a grants council, which would be composed of all grant making federal agencies. Next slide, please. The legislation would create a reform process through which longstanding challenges and red tape can be addressed and overcome. It also expressly mandates that federal agencies consult with non-federal entities. So this would be your states, local governments, territories, tribes, higher education, and you guessed it, nonprofits, during the development and implementation of their agency plans. Federal agencies would be required to pay particular attention to potential entities that have not historically received grants or cooperative agreements, which will promote dialogue early in the process so new ideas and approaches can be welcomed from the beginning rather than as a comment on the back end. The legislation expressly requires that agencies must improve user experience by mandating summaries of notices of funding opportunities to be short, so 500 words or less, in plain language and accessible. Nonprofits and others would no longer have to sift through hundreds of pages to determine whether they're eligible to apply. The act would also require agencies to include in their agency plans the steps necessary to ensure potential applicants have opportunities to receive training and assistance from the agency. The legislation also requests a report that identifies why charitable nonprofits and other non-federal entities choose not to participate in federal grant making. The report must include the experiences of faith-based and community-based organizations, rural communities, and small communities. Next slide, please. Next, I'd like to talk to you about the Charitable Act. The Charitable Act was introduced in February 2023 to extend the deduction for charitable contributions for individuals not itemizing deductions, which is about 88% of taxpayers. In 2017, federal tax law temporarily increased the standard deduction for individuals through 2025. A 2022 American Enterprise Institute analysis found that the law change did not result in upper income taxpayers donating, donating more to the work of charitable organizations, which is what it intended. In fact, charitable giving went down after its enactment, as did the number of filers claiming the itemized charitable deduction. Data has shown that the universal charitable deduction put in place by Congress temporarily during the pandemic worked. Taxpayers who took the standard deduction on their 2021 tax returns were able to claim an additional $18 billion in donations thanks to the universal charitable deduction, according to data released by the IRS. More than 47 million households utilize the tax incentive, enabling individuals to claim $300 in charitable deductions and couples to claim up to $600 in deductions while also taking the standard deduction. 21% of those donations came from taxpayers with adjusted gross income of less than $30,000. The universal charitable deduction expired after 2021. In 2022, total charitable giving from individuals, foundations, businesses, and bequests dropped by 3.4% in current dollars and 10.5% relative to inflation. Donations from in individuals fell by 6.4%, which was a decline of 13.4% when adjusted for inflation, and total giving fell to just under $500 billion. This is the only time only the fourth time in 40 years that donations did not increase year over year. The Charitable Giving Coalition, which is made up of more than 60 nonprofit and charitable organizations, sent a letter to the House and Senate on Giving Tuesday in support of charitable, in support of passing the Charitable Act. Next slide, please. So next, I want to talk about clean energy credits, which nonprofit organizations are not used to being eligible for um, tax credits. So tax exempt and governmental entities, including those 
that were generally unable to use tax credits previously can now benefit from clean energy tax credits using new options enabled by the Infl Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. Elective pay makes certain clean energy tax credits effectively refundable. With elective pay for tax years beginning after December 31, 2022, an applicable entity that qualifies for an applicable clean energy tax credit can choose to make an elective payment election, which will treat certain credits as a payment against their federal income tax liabilities rather than as a non-refundable credit. This payment would first offset any tax liability of the entity and any excess would be refundable. Applicable entities generally include tax exempt organizations, state and local governments, Indian tribal governments, Alaska Native corporations, the Tennessee Valley Authority, and rural electric cooperatives. Next slide, please. A pre-filing registration process must be completed and a registration number received prior to making an elective payment election on your annual tax return. To complete pre-filing registration, you must provide certain information about yourself, the credits you intend to earn, each eligible project or property that will contribute to the credit, and certain additional information. The IRS will receive review the information provided and will issue a separate registration number for each applicable credit property for which the entity or electing taxpayer provided sufficient verifiable information. Uh, just note your registration is not complete until you have received the registration number. Next slide, please. So over the next few slides, I've listed out the clean er energy credits that are available for this. Um, if you believe your organization is eligible for any of the credits shown on the screen and would like in additional information, please contact your BMSS tax professional. Um, a few on this slide, you've got your production tax credit for electricity from renewables, clean energy production tax credit, investment tax credit for energy property, um, you can kind of see it's all clean energy. Um, next slide. Um, there are also some specific to manufacturing vehicles and fuels, um, such as the Advanced Energy Project Credit, uh, credit for qualified commercial clean vehicles, um, clean hydrogen production tax credits. So um, like I said, if you have any questions about these or want to know if your organization is eligible for them, please reach out to your tax professional. Um, it's a kind of complex process, so we would want to go through your specific project and plans for it before giving any recommendations. Next slide, please. Um, I'm sure all of you are used to hearing about the employee retention credit. Um, so the Employee Retention Credit, which is more commonly known as ERC, was implemented during the pandemic to encourage employers to keep employees on their payroll. Earlier this fall, the IRS issued a moratorium on the processing of any new Employee Retention Credit claims through at least the end of the year, citing concerns that a growing number of new claims are potentially ineligible and stem from organizations being pressured by aggressive promoters and marketing. I know from personal experience that some of my uh, clients were contacted by some of these companies trying to get them to file um, ERC claims. Uh, next slide, please. In an effort to protect targeted businesses and potentially reduce the processing time for legitimate claims, the IRS announced a new program last month that allows companies to withdraw any current ERC claim if they are concerned about its accuracy without being charged penalties or interest. So for those wishing to withdraw an ERC claim, the following must apply. And this is all outlined on the IRS website as well. Uh, but the claim would have had to been made on an adjusted employment return. It was filed only to claim the ERC and there were no other adjustments. The withdrawal would be for the entire amount of the ERC claim. The IRS had not paid the claim or the IRS had paid the claim, but the refund check has not been cashed or deposited. Um, and then those that are not eligible to withdraw their claim based on these requirements can reduce or eliminate their ERC claim by filing amended tax return. 
I would recommend reaching out to your uh, tax professional for additional information. Next slide, please. All right, next I'm gonna cover um, form 8822B, change of address or responsible party. So IRS regulations require any entity with an EIN to update responsible party information within 60 days of any change with this form, form 8822B. You can also use this form to notify the IRS if you changed your business mailing address or business location. While organizations are not subject to penalties for failure to file this form, um, it is mandatory for changes to responsible party information. Organizations which fail to file this may not receive a notice of deficiency or a notice of demand for tax, and failure to receive these notices does not prevent the accrual of penalties and interest on any tax deficiencies. So the IRS defines a tax exempt organization, which is what we're here for today, um, their responsible party as the definition of a principal officer according to the Form 990. So um, this is an officer of the organization who, regardless of title, so they don't have to be president or treasurer, it's up, up for debate there, um, has ultimate responsibility for implementing the decisions of the organization's governing body or for supervising the management, administration, or operation of the organization. This is also the officer listed in the heading of Form 990, page 1. So while completion of the form is required for more than just tax-exempt organizations, nonprofit organizations tend to have more frequent turnover in their responsible party. So if your organization has had a change in principal officer, please be sure to timely file Form 8822B. And if you have any questions or require any assistance, please reach out to your tax professional. Next slide, please. All right, so Form 8300, Reporting of Large Cash Transactions. Um, this, is, this is something new that's coming out. Um, federal law requires persons to report cash transactions of more than $10,000 by filing Form 8300, Report of Cash Payments Over 10,000 uh, Received in Trader Business. So tax-exempt organizations are also considered persons and they may need to report certain transactions. A tax-exempt organization doesn't have to report a charitable cash contribution, but it may need to report other cash payments. So if an exempt organization receives more than $10,000 in cash to rent out a part of its building, you, may, um, you, must, have, you must report that transaction. Um, so this is effective January 1st, 2024. Um, organizations must e-file Form 8300, um, and this is based on the number of 1099s and W-2s um, that you file in a given calendar year. Um, it's if you're required to file at least 10 information returns. Um, the number of Forms 8300 filed does not affect the information return threshold requirement. So um, also important to note, a tax exempt organization must keep a copy of every form 8300 it files, along with any of the supporting documentation in the required um, statement it sends to customers for five years from the date filed. And you should keep in mind that filing electronically will provide a confirmation email that the form was filed, but e-file confirmation emails don't meet the record keeping requirement. So in e-filing, you should save or print a copy of the form prior to finalizing it and associate the confirmation number with the saved copy. Saved copy. Next slide, please. So as I close out my section of today's presentation, I wanted to make you aware of the Certified Nonprofit Accounting Professional Certification. I personally went through this um, certificate program in person, but there are also online options. Um, this is a really great choice for those who are new to nonprofit accounting or anyone who has experience who would like a better understanding of nonprofit accounting, budgeting, and compliance. 
we are actually able to offer a discount to our clients using the code Alliance Client CNAP. Um, please reach out to your BMSS professional if you'd like additional information or reach out to me if I'm not your professional. I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, this wraps up my portion of the presentation. I would like to now turn it over to Rebecca Tipton for our HR update. Thank you so much, Whitney, and hi, everyone. I have to say that nonprofit organizations have been some of my favorite clients to support, so I'm just really excited to be here. Unfortunately, 20 minutes can be a little short for a time when talking about HR topics, so I really wanted to try to focus today on an issue that I've seen a lot of, which if you want to progress to the next slide, a, that's going to be how the labor shortage is affecting nonprofits. So today I'll be going over staffing shortages, where we'll just look at some survey results and some solutions that can be put into place. And we'll look at retention strategies. Honestly, some of the solutions we'll talk about are going to be part of retention strategies as well, but we're just going to take a deeper dive into some of the key drivers so that you can really take more of a holistic approach to your retention strategy. So to get started, let's talk about staffing shortages, which I am sure is not a foreign concept for you guys as most industries have been experiencing them to some extent. And as you guys may already be aware, the National Council of Nonprofits recently published the 2023 Nonprofit Workforce Survey, which had a lot of eye-opening statistics. For example, 74.6% of survey respondents reported having job vacancies, and 51.7% reported that they have more vacancies following the pandemic. Of those vacancies being reported, 74% are in the program and service delivery areas. 41.1% are in the entry-level positions. 31.7% are in administration and HR. 25.2% were in development and fundraising. 12.5% were in senior management. And 11.1% were in communications. And all of these are really important positions for operating as a nonprofit. Next slide, please. So of course, staffing shortages don't just occur without some form of underlying cause. From the same survey, we see that 72.2% of respondents reported that their staffing shortages were chiefly due to not being able to compete with salary offers elsewhere in the job market. This really isn't a big surprise. Many industries have been suffering from staffing shortages. And unfortunately, the for-profit sector usually has a bit more wiggle room to entice candidates with better pay. Of course, 66.3% reporting the cause was due to budget factors and lack of funding are basically saying the exact same thing. They just don't have the funds to compete with the other guys. 50.2% of respondents reported that the issue was due to stress or burnout, which is also not surprising. Working in a nonprofit is hard, especially when you're working shorthanded and you're needing to pick up the extra slack. We can also connect this back to the last slide that told us 74% of respondents were feeling those staffing shortages in their service delivery areas. These guys are right up front with the issue their nonprofit is trying to support. And in a lot of nonprofits, many of these positions carry an extra psychological burden of seeing so much suffering on a daily basis. 20.6% reported their issues were caused by complications in government grants and contracts, which we can honestly link back to the funding issue and salary competition, as it does end up costing more to administer complicated grant funds, which can eat into your budget. And finally, 14.6% reported the availability or affordability of childcare was an underlying cause to their staffing shortages, as if your employees need someone to watch their children and they're unable to find that care affordable or possibly it interacts with the schedule, 
you're going to have issues keeping your positions filled. Of course, another issue surprisingly not mentioned in the survey is that a decent portion of the baby boomer generation is retiring and they're leaving the workforce. And unfortunately, the younger generations coming into the workforce are just not quite balancing out to the same number leaving the workforce. Next slide, please. So while it's nice to know that you're not the only organization with these difficulties, if you're anything like me, what you really want to know is what are the other organizations doing to actually solve the issue? So we'll start by looking at the survey results again, as they did capture this question. And we see that 57.7% implemented a remote work policy. This can be very helpful as it opens up your talent pool to people who might not have been interested otherwise due to the length of the commute to your work site or not having reliable transportation or even having a disability where working on site is just too problematic due to access issues or health reasons, or honestly, there's a many other reasons that could apply here. And 39.2% implemented diversity and inclusion trainings and strategies. This can be really helpful as it indicates an inclusive and welcoming environment for people from different backgrounds that may have otherwise felt that they would be unwelcome. 40.9% increased the current benefit offerings. You could add additional options such as medical or dependent care FSAs to help with the affordability issue. You could add additional holidays or leave options or even increased employer contributions on your existing offerings. If you're not sure whether your offerings are below or above average, you can give benefit market analysis to show what the averages are being offered for your industry. However, I would warn you to survey your employees before actually adding any new benefits, just to better understand what additional benefits would actually motivate them before wasting your money on an offering that doesn't even appeal to your particular workforce. The survey additionally reported that the following were used. Promoting career advancement opportunities, which we'll get to in a second. Expanding mental benefits and wellness programs, particularly as certain positions can be prone to burnout or high levels of stress, as we talked about and notifying employees about eligibility for the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, the PSLF, if it happens to be applicable to your service, of course. Next slide, please. Of course, there are additional options as well. You can also introduce flexible work arrangements. I know we already talked about remote work, but you can also open up your talent pool by being more accessible to people with various challenges to a normal schedule by allowing for non-standard work hours, which can be great for people with childcare responsibilities or maybe who are going to school at the same time. You can even open up a standard full-time position for job sharing, which in other words, is simply splitting the job into two different openings making it available to people who could only work part-time schedules or possibly retirees who still want to stay active, but they just don't want to commit to a full eight or nine hour day anymore. You can also implement a formal career path for employee development and growth. I love reading different surveys about employee motivation and one tidbit that has been consistently popping up is the fact that employees want to know that there is an opportunity for growth and they want their employer to help facilitate it with developmental opportunities. So having a clear path of progression that employees can follow and offering different training and development opportunities really does help. And you can get creative in your development opportunities. It doesn't have to just be paying for different classes or tuition. If you want to provide leadership development, then you can introduce a short-term task force for solving different challenges in your organization and then take turns assigning the leader to help them or assigning the leadership role to different employees to help them really grow by doing. And of course, make sure that you're providing mentorship along the way. 
You could also create targeted recruitment programs. While you should not stop your other recruiting processes, you can build upon them by targeting similar programs to your industry. For example, if you work with children, you may want to target early childhood or teaching programs at your local colleges or trade schools, both for graduates and those still in school, as your entry-level positions give them good experience for their resumes. And you're obviously in a field that interests them, or they wouldn't have committed so many years to learning the craft. Other examples include social work programs for nonprofits that work with poverty or similar situations, or veterinarian programs for animal rescues. Even if your organization is fairly well known in the community, do you remember that college graduates are not as experienced in the community yet, and they may not have considered employment or internship with your organization? Go ahead and promote those opportunities through career fairs, the career center, on-campus recruiting, or even developing a connection with the school's career services team and leaving them with brochures and marketing materials. And you should also make sure to spread the word of any vacancies to your volunteer groups. Even if the volunteers themselves are not looking for employment, chances are that they have friends who share their interests who might be open to new employment. And you can also create and implement a marketing campaign. After you finish implementing your strategies to boost recruitment, adopt a marketing mindset to promote exactly why people should want to work for your organization. Highlight the different benefits of your work environment and culture, the impact of the work that you do, and the employee benefits provided. You could also consider adding a brief video with snippets from actual employees about why they enjoy working there. And if you've identified targeted recruitment programs, you can also tailor these videos and messages to your target group, such as highlighting career development opportunities to university students and recent grads for your entry-level positions. Then ensure that you have reach by posting on external job boards, university career services pages, and other relevant locations beyond just your own career site. If you're currently in a staffing shortage, you may want to make sure that promotions for your open positions are getting as much exposure as your other outreach efforts are. And you should use outsource services or staffing services. Having worked in a nonprofit before, I can definitely attest to how very common it is to already be stretched thin, just trying to cover the day-to-day -day activities to the point where there really just isn't room for strategic special projects such as those we're describing. Just remember there are outsourced services who can help with projects such as these or even support your regular processes. And finally, you can increase your focus on retention. The logic behind this is simple. If you retain more employees, then you will have less vacancies to worry about. Of course, we're about to go into this in a little more detail. If you'll change the slide for me, please. So some of the strategies we already talked about also serve as retention strategies, such as implementing a more flexible work environment, whether through remote work or flexible scheduling, or introducing a formal career path and professional development for your employees. However, these are not the only solutions that you can try. We'll also have a brief look at comprehensive onboarding, training development, recognition, and listening to employee feedback. Next. An early start to promoting retention with your employees is boosting your onboarding program to be more comprehensive than simply covering the basic paperwork needed for hiring someone. For a truly comprehensive onboarding program, you want to cover the four C's, which are compliance, which is covered by completing your standard I-9 tax forms and any requirements that may be associated with grant funding or the nature of work being done with your organization. It's also clarification, which is covered by going through the employee handbook and personnel policies, going through the organizational chart and how each department serves the mission and interacts with each other. Culture, which is covered by explaining the organization's core values, how those values are demonstrated, the various expectations employees are held to, and the preferred methods of communication with each other. 
and connection, which can be covered with something as simple as giving the employee a tour of the facilities and directly introducing them to different people across all departments, or even improved upon with fun activities designed to encourage interaction with various people across the organization, or facilitating conversations and interactions with their new coworkers. Next. So recognition is another key driver to employer retention, but it should be delivered both formally and informally for maximum effectiveness. While formal recognition is great, it tends, it tends to be timed for specific periods of the year. And just like I would not recommend that you wait a full year to bring up a disciplinary or performance issue for coaching, I would not recommend waiting a year to give an employee kudos for something remarkable they did for the organization either, as that is a really long period of time for an employee to just assume that you don't actually care about what they managed to accomplish. Instead, find ways to celebrate these wins informally, such as a personal one-on-one -on -one thanking them, highlighting the employee's win in a group email, and bringing up the win in a team meeting. You could potentially also use your organization's HRIS message board to call out employees regularly for their good deeds. Of course, formal recognition is also important. The formal recognition can be provided during performance evaluations and informal ceremonies, such as holiday parties or large quarterly or annual company meetings with a specific spotlight on the employee recognition portion of the agenda which can inspire employees to put forth more effort in order to earn the chance to shine in the spotlight for their achievements, particularly if there is an award tied to the recognition. It can be additionally beneficial to include peer recognition as well, which can promote better interactions and cross-departmental support. And it can empower the employees by giving them a voice in who is being recognized. You can also use your recognition program to reinforce your company's culture by having a category for each of your core values that recognizes the efforts that one of your employees has used to clearly demonstrate the value. Next. So as we discussed very briefly earlier, Many surveys have shown that employees want training and development to extend beyond the, inter the introductory period to helping them grow as a professional. Of course, there is a very broad array of hard and soft skills that can be developed. So it may help to first strategize and categorize the skills that you want to help develop. You can start by identifying the different types of skills and knowledge most needed across all levels of the organization and separating your training opportunities into hard skills and soft skills, with the hard skills being the more technical skills, such as competency with a particular program, proficiency in a different language, project management, all of which can be trained using pre-established courses and programs. Soft skills are also important for professional development, but are typically more behavioral and can often benefit from more practical training, such as developing teamwork and project management skills using that internal task force committee I was mentioning earlier, or developing communication skills through such efforts as having employees prepare and deliver status reports in their respective areas during group meetings, or even implementing something similar to Toastmasters within your organization. You could even foster creativity by creating a task force for identifying development opportunities for the soft skills needed in your organization. Additionally, it would be beneficial to identify which skills and training would be the most relevant for each employee as you don't want to waste time, effort, and money on providing beginner level training on a subject in which an employee is already an expert or that would not be applicable to their career path and goals. Ideally, you should have this mapped out using both the performance appraisals, identifying which skills the employee scores less than perfect on, and by feedback from your employees, identifying their career path goals and the skills that they think they need to get there. Another key aspect to remember is to provide management training. I'm sure everyone has heard some version of the Marcus Buckingham quote, 
people leave managers, not companies. And this is mainly because for your employee, their manager represents the company they work for as leadership has approved and entrusted them to be the one to lead their employees. However, managers can make mistakes too. And it's important to provide them with just as many resources to be successful in their position as you would provide anyone else. At minimum, the managers should be provided with guidance on how to address employee relations issues, employee conflict, and performance management in a manner that is consistent with your organization's culture. However, there are many soft skills associated with management that could be honed and dedicated training initiatives. Finally, make sure to track the effectiveness of the training programs being used to ensure that you're not wasting your efforts. Ideally, this could be tracked by comparing performance metrics before and after, or by listening to feedback from surveys provided during those training development opportunities. However, you can also ask your employee directly whether they felt they gained anything, if they thought that it could, was lacking in any areas, and then just use that feedback to improve upon for the next time. Next. So finally, that brings us to listening to employee feedback. Employees want to feel heard and know that you value their input. And there are so many opportunities to do so. Often you can get really helpful feedback that will help you to not only engage that employee more, but also their coworkers. Some examples of opportune times to elicit employee feedback are asking for individual feedback about the hiring process or training programs. I've gotten great feedback in the past that helped me to hone my hiring process by simply just asking a recent hire what they enjoyed most and what they enjoyed least about the whole process. You can also use regular one-on-one -on -one discussions. By having regular one-on-one -on -one discussions with your employees, you can often learn about challenges that they're facing in the workplace that they might have otherwise not felt comfortable bringing to you on their own, such as a broken process. You can use your performance evaluations. It's a great idea to request feedback from the employee at the same time that you're providing feedback about the employee to them, as it shows that you understand employment is a two-way street. And again, you might find out about challenges or needs that are not always obvious. You can also use stay interviews. These are just periodic interviews or surveys that ask probing questions, often asking for ratings on such components as management, compensation, benefits, motivation, and more that really help you to identify what's motivating your employees to stay and what could possibly be motivating them to leave if it weren't corrected. And finally, you can use exit interviews. If your employee is leaving, it's good to know why and what changes could have possibly improved the employee's experience at your organization. So that brings me to the end of my information for you guys, as I could otherwise just keep talking your ears off about other HR issues, particularly compliance, because I love that area. So I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me today. And I'll go ahead and hand things over to Jonathan Burst from Abacus Technologies. Good morning, and thank you, Rebecca uh, and, and Whitney. Uh, that was fantastic information, uh, uh, very beneficial, uh, I am sure, uh, for the nonprofit industry and, uh, and those listening today. And, uh, and hopefully I can add some more information to that about a critical area of uh, concern. Yes, uh, even for nonprofits, and I would say especially for nonprofits. Um, you know, a saying I like to use when asked, what does cybersecurity do for us, is that cybersecurity protects profits. Now, that would seem a little bit inappropriate for the nonprofit industry. And so I guess we can reiterate that statement uh, by saying cybersecurity protects nonprofits as well. And yeah, there's a lot of a lot we can unpack in this statement, uh, just in regards to nonprofits, and we're going to try and do some of that today. How does cybersecurity protect nonprofits? Because obviously, nonprofits are not so much concerned about the bottom line, but the bottom line for nonprofits is exactly where they're able to give and do the things that they're doing, the incredible things that they're doing. 
uh, in the world to support whatever causes they're engaged in or whatever activities they're trying to uh, uh, improve the world with. And so, you know, we start to think about this a little bit. Uh, the reality is when we talk about cybersecurity and what we're protecting you from, and we're protecting you from the same thing we protect for-profit companies, and that's criminal activity. You know, not all hackers are bad. In a sense, I am a hacker, you know, and I know we think about hackers as a hooded individual, young guy in a parent's basement, you know, as Hollywood's depicted a hacker, but a lot of times it's not that. Hackers uh, are come from a lot of third world countries and they're just trying to make a living too. And frankly, hackers, it's an industry. Uh, it's a dark industry. It's a dark web industry. It's a criminal industry, but it's still an industry nonetheless. They run their businesses just like we run their businesses um, and they run our businesses. And the reality is they're trying to make money too. And so they don't care where they get it. See, the difference between hackers, ethical hackers, and non-ethical hackers is the reality that they'll break the law to do it. And whereas we'll abide by the law, so we're not playing on an equal playing field. And there are far more hackers, uh, bad hackers, criminal hackers, than there are people trying to stop them from doing what they're doing. And so it's a fight. It's an everyday fight. And the thing about criminal hackers, they don't care where the money comes from. They will take it from nonprofits as quickly as they will take it from for-profit companies. And they have no qualms about that, as I'll demonstrate in just a few minutes. But that's what cybersecurity does. And oftentimes at this point in the conversation, what companies tend to think is, well, they're not going to bother us. We're a small little nonprofit. Uh, there's no interest here. We don't have a lot of money. But again, uh, a lot of money is a very relative term. If you're dealing in the thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars even, that might not seem like a very big operation. But if you're in a third world country and your paycheck month to month working at a factory is $100 a month, Thousands of dollars is wealth. And so you have to think about it that way. You have to realize you are a target. And that's what I want to show. Next slide, please. You know, we think about nonprofits. Here's just the reality. One in four nonprofits face cyber attacks in 2023. One in four. That's over 25%. That's a staggering number. And it, it actually surprised me when I did some research for this presentation that that many nonprofits are facing cyber attacks. You know, companies like to tell me how, oh, we're not being attacked. But, you know, my response to that is often show me your email for a second and I'll show you where you've been attacked. Well, they say, nobody's attacked my email. If you've got a phishing email in your inbox right now, you've been attacked. A phishing email is an attack, but a lot of people today confuse spam for phishing email spam is harmless spam's a nuisance but it's harmless it's not going to cause you any damage it's going to waste your time whereas a malicious email a phishing email in your inbox if clicked on an attachment or clicked on the wrong link could lead to ransomware which is going to cost you money reputation which is probably the most valuable thing and then yes time and so the reality is uh, uh, thinking about one in four nonprofits facing cyber attacks, that's just the reported attacks. You know, if we start to break down the non-reported attacks, the ones that happened that nobody knew about, even the smaller scale ones, by comparison, it gets the number gets pretty staggering. But if money is in play, so are most hackers, because that's their ambition. Now, hackers can also have other reasons to attack nonprofits. They might be going after the cause. They might disagree with the cause. They might be in competition for the same resources as the cause. You know, hackers can be hired. They are for hire. And so there's all kinds of reasons that, ha uh, that nonprofits need to pay attention to the reality that you are a target. And what we do in cybersecurity is simple, and it's not easy to do, but it's simple in terms of understanding. Our goal is to reduce the risk of a successful attack. We want to keep the funds, for example, for nonprofits that you work hard raising. Uh, getting grants is not easy work. Raising money is not easy work. It takes a lot of energy and effort to get there. Well, we want to keep those funds as much as possible toward the causes those nonprofits represent. And in order to do that, yes, you might have to spend a little money by comparison, 
you know, uh, we like to think, you know, one in three, and this is probably a modest estimate for every dollar spent to prevention, it's worth $3 a cure when it comes to uh, a cyber attack. Well, and and I, well, that's probably a modest number, but the reality is, you know, we want to keep as much of that money working for your cause. We want to keep you focused on what you're able to do. That's what technology should do. It shouldn't become a hindrance and stop you altogether from doing what you do, which is what a successful attack can lead to. So these three realities play a big role. Let's move to the next slide, please. And what we're going to talk about next is the threat against nonprofits real. I think you can see already that it's real, but I want to stack this up a little bit. And yes, I hate to do it, but I'm going to scare you a little bit. I have to scare you a little bit. We have to wake up to this reality because it's out there. I find a lot of what I do is education, just opening the eyes of what's going on about there. Many people have heard of the dark web, and it sounds like an ominous place. It is a real place. It exists. And it's out there in the Internet, and it's a place where bad things happen. And bad things are conspired to happen where bad where people who are doing bad things share their capabilities to do bad things. And so is the threat against nonprofits real? Yes. And we, we need to look at some numbers that support that a little bit. So let's take a look at a couple of things. We're going to look at some recent attacks, and then we're going to look at some, some statistics as to why these attacks are successful. In 2020, and this is just some recent attacks that I, and this didn't take me, but just a couple minutes to glean this off the internet. But in 2020, Phil Abundance, a hunger relief organization, hunger relief organization, was scammed out of nearly $1 million via a fake invoice due to an email compromise. They took $1 million from an organization trying to relieve hunger. There's no holds bar here. But this is an example of the same kind of attack a for-profit industry would face. Business email compromises are huge. ACH transactions, a lot, of, a lot of nonprofits conduct their transactions through email, and that's a risky way to do business in today's threat environment. And one of the things just about any cybersecurity professional is going to tell you is we got to shore that up with some better processes and controls so that you're not at risk there. There are other ways to conduct those transactions that are much more secure than through email. But one bad email can cost a nonprofit $1 million. How long do you think it takes to raise that $1 million? It's an intangible number of effort, energy, and, you know, and pushing that ball uphill, you know, and getting it to the point where you're having some success. And man, it's staggering, but that's what happened to Phil Abundance. 2022, the International Committee of the Red Cross are crying out loud. 515,000 personal data and confidential information records were compromised on their server. Now, that might not seem like a money transaction, but at the end of the day, that costs money. That costs a lot of money. That costs trust that you're not securing personal information properly confidential information properly so that it doesn't end up on a dark web. It doesn't cause individuals concern in their personal lives because that information is now out there. But this particular attack was an example of a sophisticated attack against nonprofits. So what I mean by that is a sophisticated attack often has multiple components in that it's not an easy attack. You know, like you said a minute ago, you know, a lot of hackers work in organizations and they have specialists just like we do. They have one guy who specializes in, uh, in getting into and behind the firewall of a network. And then they have another person who is outstanding at moving around within a network undetected. And then they have social engineers who are terrific at getting people to give up information that they don't want to give up, they don't mean to give up, but they're tricked into giving up. They have people who are dedicated to these tasks and they utilize those skills. And what happened to the Red Cross was an example of a sophisticated attack, which just shows that it's not the amateurs that are just coming to bear and getting lucky against nonprofits, but it's the professional hackers, the ones who are outstanding at what they do, coming to uh, bring their 
uh, nefar nefarious skills against unwitting nonprofits. And and I got to say, and it's not a knock against nonprofits, but nonprofits are an easier target. And we'll kind of emphasize that in, a, in, in the next in a couple slides coming up here and talk about that going forward. But I want you to realize that, too, you are an easier target more often than not for obvious reasons. And uh, we'll bring that out in a second. In March 2023, this was just this year, blackballed was fined by the SEC for failure to fully disclose the extent of a ransomware attack in 2020. Now, this doesn't sound like I'm highlighting an attack so much, but what I'm highlighting is the reality that nonprofits are under the same disclosure rules as, as um, profits. If the personal information is involved, if a ransomware attack takes place, there are certain reporting requirements. And a lot of nonprofits don't realize this, but more importantly, Blackboard, Blackboard was a cloud software provider for nonprofits. This is an example of a third party or attack or vendor risk is what we call it. And what's important about that is the fact that sometimes to get to you, a hacker will go through a third party. They will go through somebody you use, somebody you do business with. And a lot of for-profit businesses don't think about this reality, as well as nonprofit businesses. It's important to recognize that who you do business with matters. Their security matters. Because let's say you're using a singular piece of software, and that is the heartbeat of what you do and where your records are stored and how you raise money and everything else. If you don't know the security compliance standards of that and they get attacked and go down, how is that going to impact your ability to do what you're trying to do? You have to think about that. You have to take some time and reflect upon that and actually put some controls and processes in place, even auditing in place to say, hey, we're not going to do business with anybody. Before we sign on and become partners here, let's talk about your security and let us tell you about our security. Then you're establishing a good relationship. Look, the reality is the one thing we're in for sure together, no matter if it's a competing nonprofit or what, we're all in this battle together against those who would steal from us. Because again, they're, 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 they'll target anybody. In September 2023, a ransomware gang, uh, yes, there are gangs out there. Uh, Bian Lian uh, claimed to have stolen 6.8 terabytes worth of data. That's a lot of data, folks. For those who don't understand megabytes, kilobytes, terabytes, the whole nine yards, the gigabytes, that's a lot of data, folks. Uh, from the nonprofit Save the Children International. Now, come on, Save the Children International and they're stealing data from them? They don't care. They will take from anybody if they can profit from it. But this is example, an example of nonprofits getting attention from big time hackers. And these are the gangs. These are the ones who do the big ransomware attacks. These are the ones who make news. They do it for notoriety. They do it sometimes uh, for social agendas to, uh, to uh, push their agenda, but other times they do it just because they can. And they don't care who, again, save the children. That's almost as bad as hunger relief organization. It makes me angry thinking about it, but there it is. It's happening and it's happening now and it's happening more frequently because it's a lucrative career field. People actually see this as a career option. They're in a dead end job. And so I can do some criminal activity. And my daughter who went to Denver University actually had a, uh, uh, when we went to her graduation, I was talking to one of her professors who, who has studied and deals with international law. And we were talking about when he found out what I did, he said, oh, I feel sorry for you. And he says, why is that? He said, because there is no international law for cybersecurity. And it's so true. They don't have to worry about criminal prosecution for doing this, which makes it even more tempting to go down this road and steal. And they know we have insurance and they think we have bottomless wealth. And by comparison, perhaps we do, but still, it just sweetens the deal for them. And so we want to talk about this now. Let's just think about a couple statistics here real quick. Uh, I could take all day on that, but 27% of nonprofits worldwide have fallen victim to cyber attacks. That's over one in four folks. 
68% of nonprofits do not have documented policies and procedures in place should a cyber attack occur. This matters. You know, a lot of for-profit companies struggle in this area too, but it's even more important for nonprofits, I think, because their workforce a lot of times is volunteer. It's got to, they got to have documented policies in place. And not only that, those policies are only as good as they're enforced, as good as they're audited, as good as they're carried out and made to be, they're, they're put there to secure. And so it's real important that your teams are educated in these policies and procedures. And these policies and procedures are well thought out and make sense, but it's critical. But And that's a lot of times where the things begin to break down on the cybersecurity front for nonprofits. But 71% of nonprofits allow staff members to use unsecured personal devices to access organization emails and business files. This is a growing area. We work in a remote workforce. People use their phones. These mobile phones now are personal computers. That's not a phone you're carrying in your pocket. It's a, it's a powerful computer. And we need to realize that 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 information, perhaps personal information, perhaps sensitive information is being stored on unsecured devices. That's a big risk. And then less than 50% of nonprofit organizations have internal procedures or policies in place to manage how data is shared with external agencies. You know, the one thing that connects us all is email and email is the biggest risk factor for cybersecurity. Most attacks start with a single email, one mouse click, one choice, one mouse click, and voila, an attack has taken place and was successful. Next slide, please. And so are you at risk? Is your nonprofit at risk? You know, if we were doing this interactively, I'd ask for a show of hands, you know, but the reality is do you conduct e-commerce on your website. And well, we're not in e-commerce. Yes, you are. If you collect donations and event registrations, you're into e-commerce. It's the same thing. Same technology drives both for the profit or nonprofit industry. Do you store or transfer personally identifiable information? We call this PII about anyone, including donors, your staff, et cetera. If you do, you have risk that you need to consider there. And do you collect information on preference or habits of donors, patrons, or even newsletters or subscribers? Look, any, any, any nonprofit that is going to grow and be successful where they are is certainly doing this. And so I think you can see there is risk, cybersecurity risk associated with what you do, which is where I wanted to start with this. The, the, the big takeaways, if we look at the next slide, one, the threat is real. The threat is real, and it informs us that we need to put cybersecurity on our agendas. You know, you can be proactive about this or reactive. The problem with reactive is it's going to cost you a lot of money, and you're going to get nothing in return. It's going to cost you time and reputation, and you're going to get nothing for that. You're going to raise a lot of funds, and the hackers are going to take it. Criminal hackers are going to take it. Or you can put it on your agenda, be proactive about it, get ahead of the curveball, and find that you can stop a lot of this, prevent a lot of this. It's very, it's, it's kind of tragic when we'll investigate an attack and they realize that if they had just put something like multi-factor authentication in place, it would have cost them maybe 200 bucks to have it implemented. If they had just put that in place, it would have stopped this attack could have stopped this attack from ever happening. Something as simple as that. And so you want to put it on your agenda. You want to do it on purpose. You want to do it in, in a measured and reasonable way. You want to do it in a risk-centric way that takes a look at your biggest risks where you can, you can utilize your funds in the best way possible and then attack the cybersecurity problem head on. You know, I often get the question, why don't we take the attack to hackers? You know, why don't we start attacking them back? Well, I'm going to tell you why. One, they're better at it than we are. And two, they don't play by the rules. They don't have rules. Whereas we have to play by the rules or we go to jail. And so we have to recognize that you, the only way to take the attack is to put, just make it hard for them to do what they do. Don't make it easy is probably a better way to put that for them to do what they do. And then we're going to start to win that battle. Let's look at the next slide real quick. I want to talk about just briefly as we close this out, 
what can a nonprofit do to protect itself? First thing I'm going to say is prioritize security initiatives for a limited budget. Look, prioritize. Look at where you can get the most effectiveness for your money, where you can reduce your risk the most. It's, it's kind of like a baseball analogy. When you got that batter standing in the box, if he's not a good hitter or she's not a good hitter, you're going to tell him, bend down a little bit, shrink that strike zone, make it harder for the pitcher to throw a strike so we can get you on base. It seems like an un, uh, unreasonable tactic, but it's not. It's a good tactic. It's a necessary tactic sometimes. We need to shrink our strike zones the ways hackers can attack us. And you and nonprofits want to do it on a limited budget because they want to keep those funds in play for their causes, for what they're what they're working for. And so it's important that you prioritize those security initiatives. Get it on your agenda. Prioritize them. Have a plan. Talk to a cybersecurity professional who is risk-based, who can help you manage those and give you a good insight as to, well, yeah, you can buy this big program that's going to do this, 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 and that, or you can just simply turn on this setting in Microsoft 365, and you're going to get actually more protection by that than you would buying this big software suite. Something to think about. Second thing, educate your people on cybersecurity. I can't emphasize this enough. I can't say it enough. It's an investment in your team. It's an investment. It's proactive. Ultimately, you can pay millions of dollars to the best defensive software in the world, and it's going to boil down to that one person on your team making the choice to click on a hyperlink they knew they shouldn't have clicked on. Educate your people on cybersecurity, especially in the nonprofit realm where there might be volunteer uh, uh, volunteerism, uh, and you want to educate them on cybersecurity as well. They're not getting paid to do this, but they have to be, you have to treat them that way, educate them. And frankly, it's just going to help them on a personal level too, because any education you give them applies in their home life as well. Focus on securing the transaction of money. Can't emphasize this enough. You know, conducting those business transactions through email, not a good practice. We got to find better ways to do that. There are better ways to do that. And we've got to talk through that. We've got to make sure that we're looking at these controls, assessing how we're doing these things, and then attack them in a more secure way, approach them in a more secure way. And one of those ways ties to the next point, establish strong internal controls. A strong internal control, you can have internal controls where you documented how something's supposed to happen. But the difference between an internal control and a strong internal control is that's, that control is audited. People are actually monitoring it. So when it doesn't happen the way it should have, somebody is being corrected, not disciplined, but corrected. So it's always happening the way it's supposed to happen. Because again, just like that one email somebody knew they shouldn't have clicked on, that one time somebody didn't follow the process, the control is the one time you're going to get hit. And lastly, emphasize policy and process. Don't assume document and enforce it. Don't just come up with a list of policies and processes that nobody looks at, nobody even knows where they're at, and nobody is following. Don't assume they're being followed either, because chances are they're not. Document it, enforce it, follow up on those. Make sure those policies are well thought out. Eliminate needless policy, because that's not that just generates the need to avoid those things. Next slide, please. You know, I want to close this out with this simple thing. Take advantage of the cybersecurity controls already available to you. I, you have a suite. If you're using, for example, Microsoft 365 for your email environment, depending upon your licensing, you have a pretty robust array of controls to help protect you already. No, they're not the best in the market, but they are better than nothing. And you can simply, if you know where to find those or have somebody who can help you find those, we have to do this all the time in, at Abacus. We, uh, uh, we go in and we assess those controls and see what controls are turned on and what are not. It's, and sometimes it's not easy. Microsoft didn't put these right up front. Some of them are buried pretty deep, but these powerful controls can change the game. For example, simply turning on, if you're not a worldwide industry, a worldwide nonprofit, and you're just dealing in America or the Southeast here, we can actually turn on a control in Microsoft that will prevent email, anybody from 
foreign countries from logging in to your email servers. That's a huge protection right there. MFA, multi-factor authentication, that is an 85% risk reduction because it stops. It's not a silver bullet. It's not going to stop every attack. There are workarounds to get around MFA, but those are for highly skilled hackers. Your average hacker, MFA is going to be stop them in their tracks. They're not going to go any further. And it's also going to alert you that you are being attacked. And so again, take advantage of the cybersecurity controls already available to you. You don't have to spend a whole lot more money. Just use what you got. And if you don't know how to use that's get somebody who can help you bring in a professional. Don't ask for an IT guy to do your cybersecurity. IT guys are great at keeping everything running, but sometimes they're, they don't, they, that's not their function. You need somebody who can keep an eye on your cybersecurity. And it does take a lot of effort and energy to do that. And that's what you want in place. And so with that, uh, that kind of ends my portion of the presentation. It went a couple minutes longer than I wanted to, but I'm going to turn things back over to John and, and truly appreciate your time and your attention this morning. All right. Uh, thank you very much, panelists. Um, I know I speak for everyone that in saying that we're uh, tremendously grateful for the valuable information that you shared with us. Uh, we've got a few questions in the Q&A. Um, we want to be respectful of your time and close right at 10 o'clock, uh, but I'll pitch these uh, questions out. And I think the way it's coming down right now, we've got one for each person. So uh, equality, uh, that's what we're after. Um, so Rebecca, this one's for you. Uh, does BMSS offer outsourced HR services and what does that look like typically? Yes, uh, probably, I, a, probably a broad base of what that looks like. BMSS definitely offers outsourced HR services. That's what I do. I And that honestly looks different based on each client's needs. It, it really comes down to what you need support with. There are many clients where I just help them with one-off projects, maybe updating their handbook, setting up a new program, doing an HR audit. Or there's several clients that I work with on a more ongoing basis, kind of either providing regular consultation as the client needs it, or even acting as a bit of a part-time HR manager. So if you have a need, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to talk with you about it, see if it's a good solution for you. Right. And uh, you can go to our website, bmss.com, and find Rebecca on there and get her contact information. All right, Whitney, I believe this next one will be for you. Uh, for the $10,000 cash reporting requirements, what constitutes related transactions? Uh, for the rent example, if you received 1,000 cash monthly for rent of a facility, does that get aggregated for the reporting requirement? And if so, when are you required to make the report? After month 10, when you actually have received the aggregate 10K? Hey, this is a great question. Um, so typically related transactions are considered um, ones made within 24 hours, but in this case with the rent, um, this would be a multiple payment scenario. So um, if the first payment's more than $10,000, which in this case it's not, then you would immediately report. But if it was the $1,000 monthly over 10 months, then yes, at the end of the 10-month period when it hits $10,000, then you would have 15 days to file the um, Form 8300, and then you would start a new period for the reporting. So you would start back over at zero. And that is available as well on the IRS website under multiple payments. Great. Thank you, Whitney. Um, Jonathan, does Abacus do any kind of security analysis that can poke holes in our weak spots? Love the question. Thank you for it. Uh, I feel like it's a Pepsi Cola pitch because now I get to talk a little bit about Abacus. And, you know, truth be told, next semester I'm teaching a course at UAB on exactly this. I'd like to title it Poking Holes in Cyber and in Defenses, but it's really called what we call it in the industry is penetration testing is the big fancy word for it. And yes, we do. We do do penetration testing, but it's more important. It's yes. If you have anything facing the internet, you want to find out how a hacker can get in. 
and we do do that. And there's a variety of tests you do to see if there are vulnerabilities in your external defenses and if they can get behind your firewall to your actual you know, to your actual uh, information. And that's what you're trying to protect. And at the same time, it's important that you assess internally as well, because what happens if they get behind your network? That's where the real danger is, what they can do once they get in there. And those, so there are protections that can be put in place there. So not only do we rec recommend the external test, but we also recommend internal assessments as well. Because it's important to know this is resiliency. You got to know where the holes in your fence are. And then you got to know what kind of damage they can do once they get in as to how well you respond to that. And so, yes, to answer the short answer is yes, we do. And, you know, it's important. We recommend it like a annual physical. Your right. environment's going to change over the year. Get a physical. Thanks, Jonathan. Hey, Whitney, uh, I think sort of a, a follow up on that 10,000 reporting. Um, is is that true cash or includes checks, et cetera? So cash is coins and currency of the U.S. and a foreign country. It can also include cashier's checks, bank drafts, traveler's checks, and money orders. Um, so it's not just cash payments. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and then uh, there's one on here. Uh, I'll actually handle this one. Uh, if our organization is happy with our current audit tax firm, but our accounting department needs more day-to-day -day help, can BMSS help us? Um, absolutely. Reach out uh, to any, any of us on the panel. Uh, negotiate to our website and, and find our not-for-profit group there. But we have a very robust, uh, we call it CAS, Client Accounting Services area. And uh, they can help you in a in a variety of ways with month to month uh, in as little uh, amount of help or as much, uh, which would include the total outsourcing of your accounting function. So uh, we would love to uh, talk to you about that. And then um, there's one here. Where can we get information on the CFO certifications mentioned in the presentation? Um, I think this is referring to the certified nonprofit Cert yeah, I think professional. So as well. um, I can have that be sent out. There's information on the um, BDO FMA page. Um, and we've previously sent out some information on it, but I can get your contact information and send it to you directly as well. Okay. And then I will... Uh wrap up with this one and pitch it to each one of you. Um, you sort of covered it in each one of your presentations, but uh, just to kind of wrap up, we're getting close to the end uh, and uh, we can just go in the in the uh, order of presentation. So Whitney first, uh, what do you think nonprofits should be most concerned about going into 2024? Well, um, the answer to that is both of the things that really Rebecca and Jonathan covered. Um, I went to the AS ASCPA's uh, conference this summer for nonprofits, and um, I made friends with someone who said, oh my gosh, I just got this email where our executive director emailed our entire board of directors our bank statement, and it's like a huge endowment, millions of dollars, full account numbers sent via email. Um, so cybersecurity is definitely big, uh, making sure that your board and your employees understand um, what to do, what not to do, and keeping your organization secure. And then um, the hiring shortage as well. I mean, nonprofits are being hit really hard because often it's hard to um, to compete and, and it's a tight job market. Go ahead. Thank you, Whitney. Rebecca? It's really hard to answer in absolutes as just one. A cybersecurity, honestly, I'm going to get behind that as well. I've worked for a nonprofit that got hit by a, mans a massive ransomware, and it took two months to unravel that. And just, to, in, just in the HR department, so much of our files and data were just gone to us. We felt like we were basically working back in the caveman days with how little we had. We were having to create forms from scratch and everything. It was horrible. 
I, but other than that, I mean, I I rely back on making sure that you have your staffing really in place as far as those retention programs so that you don't find yourself having to stop operations just because you don't have enough people on board. Gotcha. Thank you, Rebecca. Jonathan? Yeah, John, I, you know, at the risk of sounding self-serving, I'm not going to I think disagree. we all know what the answer is going to be. <laughs> I think I'm going to agree with Rebecca and Whitney, but I'm going to add this. Look, we're all closely related. It's about finances, so you can't ignore what Whitney's talking about. And you know how many scams are HR related in terms of cybersecurity? So you better be paying attention to your HR as well. Look, the two biggest attackers, are people being attacked and being spoofed are the bosses and the wallets. And you know what? Let's not knock the fact that while cyber ransomware gangs and all that scare me, the IRS scares me pretty good too. And so I'm not going to ignore the financial components of doing things right, as Whitney pointed out, and making sure you're on top of that. And so, yes, to all of it, by every stretch, but yeah, pay attention to cybersecurity. Yeah, and, and I'll throw in there as well. I mean, a concern for 2024, I mean, we, we all keep hearing about the economy, the economy, the economy, and is a recession coming? Is it not? And I think the answer is, who knows? Uh, but I do think as a, a nonprofit, it's incumbent upon you, uh, your board, uh, your, your financial arm of your organization to, to really uh, be looking you know, prospectively into 2024 and creating some sort of uh, recession plan. Uh, and looking at your, your revenue sources and where your money's coming from and your war chest and, and being ready. Uh, I, I feel like by all accounts, it seems to be that everyone's uh, somewhat predicting a soft landing. Um, but, you know, it doesn't take much to turn a soft landing into a hard landing. So I would really uh, look at your budgets, look at uh, just take a hard look at all the areas of your organization and be ready if something changes in 2024. So uh, with that said, again, thank you, panelists. We really do appreciate you taking the time to get ready for this and then also presenting. Um, thank you, everyone who's joined us here today. Uh, we really do appreciate it. As a reminder, CPE certificates will be issued approximately two weeks following today's webinar. Uh, this webinar, I believe we've recorded it and it should be out on our website, hopefully by the end of the day today. And again, thank you very much for attending and I hope you have a great holiday season.